Hey, welcome to the L. Russ Show. My name is L. Russ, and I am a number one best selling author and master coach. My intention is to inspire, educate, and motivate you with weekly content featuring amazing guests and solo episodes. Visit my website, lrust.com, to learn more about me, my courses, free master classes, partner discounts, and much more. Enjoy the show. Richard Dixie, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Nice to hear you. I, I I love your bio. First of all, let's going to throw out here. Richard has a great new book called Three Minutes a Day, a 14-week course to learn meditation and transform your life. You hold some advanced degrees in biophysics and the history and philosophy of science, a topic that I love. How did you get involved? Well, I mean, your what is your trajectory to becoming a senior faculty member and also getting into the work of meditation? How did you oh find God. this? Life history. <laughs> yeah, let's go through the life history. The life history. Well, you know, I was educated as a scientist. Um, and I discovered, you know, my education, you know, I come from a generation where big science was a thing. And, you know, scientists at that time were saying, oh, science is going to explain everything. Everything is going to be explained by science. And I soon but soon I woke up in my very late teens to the realization this was not the case, that there were huge elements of our experience which are never going to be explained by science. I didn't quite know why, but I had that deep intuition that there was something wrong. And that took me to India. And I took a year off my university degree and I went to India. I met all kinds of extraordinary things and all kinds of amazing experiences in India, came back, finished my degree, and then landed up realizing that. There was something else, and it was you could see traces of it in the Western esoteric tradition and in the great interest, which has now grown and grown since that period in, you know, astrology and the tarot and all kinds of palmistry. There are all kinds of old knowledges that would have been normal in the medieval period that just somehow become illegitimate by the, the march of science. And that really has been the dialogue in my life. And what happened was I landed up running an esoteric school, actually, working initially under the, the, the tutelage of a teacher and then eventually being one of its directors. But I began to realize quite uh, late on in this experience that the problem was that these traditions that rely entirely on subjectivity are liable to be influenced by opinion. The opinion can be benign, in which case they're just mistaken. Or it can be malign, in which case people start making stuff up to make money or make friends or get political power or many other nasty things. And I began to realize, my God, that's exactly what has happened in Western history. We've gone through periods where the rise of individual people saying, I have the truth, has been countered by people saying, no, the truth is objectively obtainable. And in many ways, my education was informed by this because the great fascist movements that were defeating the Second War gave rise to a great belief in positivism that somehow scientific views would be absolutely true and we would be able to defeat fascist ideas once and for all. And of course, I was educated at the period when that was beginning to fade and the hippies were coming in and the psychedelic revolution and all that. And people realizing, no, that isn't the case. And so anyway, I realizing that information can be manufactured like this I went back into my scientific career and ended up running a laboratory for 14 years, looking at things that were on the fringe of science. Initially, I was looking at healing, and then I began looking at the biological effects of electromagnetic fields. But towards the end of that period, I realized that my intuition about the Asian traditions had been correct. And there was a tradition with unbroken lineage that did stress the probity of individual experience and could be a a rectifier, a, uh, a way of making whole the problem that scientific materialism presents. And that is the Asian traditions of meditation. And then I landed up running a company. And during that time, I was developing my meditative practice. I used to be called the Buddhist businessman in England. That was, that was, that was my moniker. It was quite a well-known company. And then in 2007, having married a wonderful girl who's the eldest daughter of Tartang Rinpoche, now my wife, Wang Mo, and having two children in London, I landed up coming back to America to educate the kids here and work with Wang Mo 
both to, to revitalize the Dharma traditions in Southeast Asia, particularly in India, and also to start Dharma College, which is an institution which is dedicated to bringing, reimagining wisdom, bringing the wisdom traditions of Asia back to Western culture in Western language. And it was during that period that I began to teach meditation, taking many influences from Tibetan teachers and Southeast Asian teachers, and realizing that the keys to meditation could be taught very quickly in just a few minutes a day. And it was really from that that the book came about. So, so we, I think we, two minutes. Yeah, you know, that's great. So I know that, you know, most people out there at this point sort of understand that there's some undeniable benefits of meditation, whether that's focused concentration, better health, all of that. Can you just give us a rundown, though, for people that don't understand what the benefits are and what the studies that have been done? Like, what are these benefits and why we should get into it? Yeah, well, meditation um, was obviously fashionable in the 70s as a, as a way of expanding consciousness. And was very linked with that whole consciousness expansion movement. And then in the 80s and 90s, it began to lose focus because, you know, people didn't have the success they were hoping. And then this idea of meditation being good for your health came about, particularly with the rise of Vipassana meditation, which is a particular form of meditation and the work of John Kabat-Zinn. And essentially, I think we can boil it down to this. If you meditate, you become more emotionally resilient. Now, this word resilience is very interesting. It means that you can be flexible and less disturbed by external pressure. And of course, since the millennium in the last 20 years, the and the, the rise of, of particular smartphones, people's tension in their lives, the nonstop pressure that they receive from electronic devices has gone up and up and up. And with it, the interest in whether there's any way we can mitigate that pressure. And indeed, we can. And the meditation traditions are extremely effective. And so at a minimum, meditation is good for you because meditation makes you more emotionally resilient. And there are many, many, many uh, academically conducted, formally conducted studies that demonstrate this. Of course, this is just a minimum. Really, meditation is about understanding your life. So the fact is, if you understand your life well, you will be less emotionally resilient. So emotional yes, self-exploration, right? Yes, you begin, you begin to explore. Now, this comes down to a profound issue, which is really what informed my whole life trajectory. Namely, ultimately, all experience is personal. There is no objective experience we can have because everything that we know and everything that we experience comes through either our five senses or our mind. There's nothing we can know external to either our five senses or our mind. That is not to say there is no external world, and it's not to say that we can't know anything about it, but we can only know by inference. We have to make inferences, guesses, educated guesses. And scientific analysis is educated guesswork. It is not generating absolute confidence. Any scientist would tell you that every theory they generate is just a theory. It's never proven. Some other theory can come along and knock it off its perch. And this happens all the time. We call it progress. However, the way we generate those theories is essentially personal. Now, the problem is our education system totally fails to address the personal. There is no attempt made at any point in our education system to look at how we generate our ideas about the world, how we generate our sense percepts, how we generate any experience. And this is what meditation directly addresses. So my view is that Meditation should be taught along with reading and writing in primary school. It's not really, uh, it's a life skill that's so central to being a human being that it's extraordinary that it's totally ignored. And that really is what informs the three minute a day approach. This is not some esoteric activity for people who are on a religious quest or whatever. It's a basic life skill that enables you to understand your experience. I love it. The I want to transition really quick into just philosophy of science, which is sure. you know essentially, essentially it's right. I mean, for people out there listening, it's 
it questions it questions like what qualifies as science, right? Like the reliability of theories, the ultimate purpose of it. So being someone that had a scientific background and granted, not that there hasn't been studies or scientific studies on meditation, um, some other beliefs or astrology or some of these other woo-woo concepts or anything that people are talking about, like, oh, you know, you can, you can intend things like this. Everyone would say that it's absolutely unprovable. There's no science behind it. So I'm just curious, what in your world as you have you've gone through life that you believe, even though you have a scientific background, that the rest of the scientific community would poo-poo? They would say, not enough evidence, uh, you know, but you believe it. Well, I, I think I, I'm going to ask that in, in a very simple manner. Um, not modern cognitive psychology has been gradually making discoveries about how we process experience, how, how we process sensations into experience. And what is absolutely remarkable is how the discoveries that are made through these techniques are merely confirming what is recorded in medieval writings on experience. It is quite clear that the medieval philosopher monks who were developing the meditation traditions, and this is 2000 years ago now, were writing about phenomena that can now be quote unquote objectively demonstrated. But they did so example? any oh, a good example is the intermittent arising of consciousness. For example, it's now understood that consciousness arises intermittently. It's not a continuous experience. It flickers. And this was recorded in the fourth century, the flickering of consciousness. Mm. So it's clear that you can make introspection now, this word introspection needs to be carefully defined, so we'll come back to what it means. But you, ca- you have a faculty to look within, which can be developed reliably. The problem is this, and you will, you will understand this as someone scientifically trained. Modern scientific materialism arises with Galileo, and Galileo was specific in criticizing any insights that arise from direct experience. He said they were merely naming, and they weren't reliable. We needed an external, reliable way of generating knowledge. And that began the whole experimental science movement, which is what we now call science. What the Greeks called science was not experimental at all. It was merely observational. So it's very important to realize this. And this rise of experimental science has led to this strange notion of scientific truth, as if the word truth applied to a scientific insight is the same meaning as the word truth applied to a religious or philosophical insight. But it is not. Scientific truth is merely what is demonstrated by experiment. Mm -hmm. If you find a new experiment, you may find a new scientific truth. But people think that science is somehow the arbiter of truth with a capital T truth. Absolute nature of things. But it is not. And no scientist would ever claim that. And so there's where the misconception comes from. And believe you me, my life story is about grappling with this misconception. Yeah, I bet. And realizing that while science is incredibly valuable, I mean, in no way am I suggesting it's not valuable. And furthermore, the benefits it is brought are manifest. Nonetheless, in a fundamental sense, human happiness and human contentment is not improving. If anything, it's getting worse. And this is because the capital T truth, I, what does it mean for me? How am I going to find truth with a capital T for me is not something that science can ever give you. You can, never, you can only ever find that yourself with your own experience. And unfortunately, as I mentioned before, our contemporary education system makes no attempt to address this whatsoever. And as a result, people leave school alienated, feeling it's meaningless, not really knowing what they're doing. And furthermore, on top of that, you can see that not only do ancient writings address personal experience as if they were written yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so you can see there has been no progress. For example, if you read the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, written in 150 AD, honestly, he could have been writing that yesterday. Yeah, there same with, no same with like uh, some of the ancient Greek philosophers, right? They talk about your perceptions, how you see perceive a thing versus what the thing is. And, you know, I mean, this is, yeah. And sometimes you're like, that's some modern day, you know, self-help. 
Exactly. And then if you project forward in science fiction, what do we have? Science fiction writers saying nothing is going to change. We'll have better and better spaceships, better and better weapons, but we will be just the same. And this is where the problem lies. If we're not really careful, humanity is in a very dangerous state now in which we have more and more powerful technology. And we live in an age of scientific discovery and exploration that is truly historical. It's remarkable. But the intelligence, the ability to deal with this incredible power is not developing. And that's because that can only come from within. Now, the great religions offered solutions to this. The problem is the great religions relied on faith. And as we get more and more educated, it becomes more and more difficult to believe in some of the assertions that they make. What we really need is to have a method of dealing with our own perceptions. And this is what meditation offers. It's not a religion. It's a life skill. And when, with it comes a much deeper appreciation of what it means to be human and a path to find meaning in experience, which is otherwise lost in all the external pressures that we are, we are subjected to. What's one of the most profound, memorable experiences you've had after or during a meditation? Well, you know, one of the things that you begin to realize as you calm into meditation, and the 14 Weeks book is essentially about calmness meditation, is that you are not separate from your experience. Now, most of us have the idea that we are somehow watching our experience, as if our experience is external to us. We on the inside are looking at it on the outside. As we begin to calm and quieten, this positioning of me and it as separate entities begins to collapse. And we suddenly realize that the experience we're having is all that is happening. There is nothing else. There are not two. There's only one. And when you get up from an experience like that and you look at someone else, it is blindingly obvious. When I talk to someone else or see someone else, I don't see two things. I don't see their body and them inside it. There's just one thing, that person. And so our idea about other people as being one thing turns out to be true of ourselves. We are also one thing. It's just that we are being triggered by reactivity into thinking we are two things, namely the problem and us. This is happening to me, this language. And this is one of the big insights that meditation begins to generate, a realization that what we think we are and what we actually are are different. And what we actually are is accessible if we simply become less reactive. And once we generate that unification, we find we have a host of faculties, a host of abilities that were otherwise lost to us. That's really the deep, that's the deep door that meditation begins to open. So not only do we become more emotionally resilient, but we suddenly find we have insights and approaches that are simply not available to people who don't meditate. And this is where the big benefits start to manifest. Let's talk about some 180 degree stories with meditation, changes that you've witnessed in people's lives after adopting this, after following the 14 week course, you know, where they were, where they are now, what people are telling you. I'd love to hear about some of those success stories to inspire us to jump on it as well. And there might be people out there listening going, yeah, it's not for me, or I tried it and didn't work or, you know, this kind of stuff. So I'd love to hear some transformational stories that pop oh. to mind. I know you have many of them, but some of the favorites that pop up. Yeah, well, let's just, I mean, so why, there are a lot of people who've, tr who've quote unquote, tried meditation and have given up. I mean, it's got to be in the millions. Um, and the reason is because the meditation traditions that have come down to us have been developed by Asian monks, mainly people who are in monastic robes and are literally full time spiritual practitioners. And not surprising, they meditate for hours. And so the, 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 the assertion has been made that somehow you have to meditate for hours to have any benefit from meditation. And of course, people try to do this and they fail and they think, well, meditation is, quote, not for me, unquote. This is deeply unfortunate because there is no need to meditate for hours to get the fundamental insights that meditation offers. Now, what are those? It is that when things attract 
capture our attention, we lose control. Now, this, this, the proper term for this is when things advert our attention, they grab our attention, we, are, we, we sense a, a feeling of lack of control. Advertising is quite literally the art of adverting someone's attention. And with the rise of modern technology, advertising has become so sophisticated that now we have, with the rise of chatbots, devices that can write things that advert our attention, never mind about put things on billboards. We are literally surrounded by dog whistles, all of whom are adverting our attention. As a result of that, we land up feeling that our life is meaningless. And this is because the process of adverting is unconscious. And so whatever we want to do is being pulled this way and that by people whose interests are purely economic. They're just trying to make money out of us. Not surprisingly, we get exhausted and feel like nothing is worth doing. Now, when people begin to meditate, even for short moments, and they realize they can control their reactivity, a complete transformation happens. It's not merely they become a little bit happier, a little bit more calm or whatever. They suddenly find they have control over their reactivity. Now, initially, that control may be only intermittent. The fact that it happens at all is a bright light because there is the target. Once you see that control is possible. Now, I'm not talking about control after we have been adverted, where we go, oh, I shouldn't be doing that. It's control before we are adverted, before our attention is grabbed. Once we realize we can get control at that level, we can find something fundamental, which is our own autonomy as human beings. Of course, if we want to be interested in something, we allow ourselves to be adverted by it and we go ahead and get engaged with it. But we're no longer then vulnerable to being manipulated the whole time by seemingly benign looking things in, in our sense fields that turn out to be designed to grab our attention. Now, that has a profound effect. It really does. People say, wow, this has changed everything. Not just one thing, it's changed everything. And it's not that the change is dramatic. The change is gradual, but progressive. It's like the sun coming up or something. Gradually, 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 as we do our little three minute exercises, we suddenly find we have a place of calmness from which we can decide whether we're going to be influenced by this or influenced by that. We're no longer being swept up into feelings of anger and disgust or feelings of desire or aversion, all of these otherwise unstoppable feelings that we're subjected to. And that I've seen many times. Many of the people who've taken these short courses experience this. I love that. Um, let's talk about the, the the different types of meditations because, you know, there's the people that are like, I went to this meditation class and I sat there and I had to repeat this much. Just, uh, I don't like it. And then other people really gravitate towards guided meditations. Um, I like guided meditations, but I also like another meditation CD by someone who it's quiet, you're doing nothing, but then almost at the right time, she chimes in and, and kind of alerts you to your mind wandering and getting back to the present. And then you kind of keep going. So can you break down like the different types of meditation? And then the three minute I'm assuming is just you in silence, but give, give us a rundown of that. Okay. There, there are only two types of meditation. There is calmness meditation, sometimes called shamatha. And there's insight meditation, sometimes called vipassana. There are only two types. Calmness meditation is designed to lessen our reflexive reactivity to sensory inputs that advert our attention. That is what it's designed to do. It's, not, it's called calmness meditation because if we cease being grabbed the whole time, by things that, are, that appear to us or we hear or we feel or we touch or we think, all the so-called six gates of experience. If we cease being grabbed all the time, we become calm. Gradually, we start finding a sense of peace. Now, this is a capacity that's literally a skill like learning to play the violin. There are many ways you can do it. You could do it through guided meditation. If the, if the guide knows where they're going, they can gradually encourage you to become calm. 
You can do it through breath watching, sensation watching meditation. There are many, many techniques. I give a number of them in this book. And the idea is that you learn to take your attention, place it on an object and relax there. And when other things happen, we just don't react to them. This is a skill. Now, just like a water, a glass of water with a bunch of dust in it, if we're always being grabbed this way and that, the water's all cloudy, we can't see clearly, we don't know what we're doing, we feel muddled, we feel exhausted and frazzled. As we simply let the glass of water sit, it gradually clarifies. Now, what happens when it, the water clarifies is we find we can see clearly. That's called V pasana. Pasana means clearly, and V means discriminatively or, or, or penetratingly or clearly see. So pasana is seeing, V means clearly or penetrating, V pasana. So we began to see our circumstance. Now, the whole idea is our innate intelligence, what, what you could call our common sense, our, the, the actual bedrock of our humanity, is always being clouded over by this process of unconscious reactivity. So as we gradually learn how to become calm, then we start seeing clearly. Then we can ask the big questions. What is the meaning of life? What should I do next? What is valuable and what is not? These questions that we know we really want to ask ourselves, but somehow we can't get the clarity of mind to address, become readily available as objects of inquiry. Now, each one of us has our own path. It's not that you know meditation leads to some end point. It's far, far more, it's that meditation opens a door to a life well lived. Some people want to go on and meditate eight hours a day that's great i want to do that why not other people will simply find that when life is getting on top of them they can learn to be non-reactive remember that long non-reactivity adopt it for a very short period maybe even five seconds and then find ah that's what i should do and go forward other people may find in their journaling or in their prayer or in their contemplative life, or whatever they're doing, their artistic expression, there are so many places where the simple ability to take a step back is of great value. Now, this calmness meditation, the key to it, is to understand concentration. There are many, many misconceptions that people have about meditation. One is that we should be free of thoughts, that somehow if you meditate, you will become free of thoughts. And the idea is to have no thoughts. This is absolutely incorrect. This is not a correct understanding. Meditation is not to have no thoughts. It's not to be reflexively reacting to thoughts. Thoughts will come and go like clouds in the sky. The problem with thoughts in our normal state of mind is whenever a thought comes, we chase it like a dog chasing a bone. We land up being grabbed by it and taken down some rabbit hole. That is the problem. As we learn to become less reactive, so thoughts can come and go and we find ourselves unaffected by them. Thoughts are merely this extraordinary mental apparatus that we're born into doing its thing, saying, could be this, could be that, should I do this, should I do that? All of this activity is completely normal. It's no more abnormal than breathing. It's just part of our physiology. That is the first thing. The second misconception is that we should abide in calmness. We should make a little calm castle in which we live like a king behind his walls and somehow life goes on outside us, but we're unaffected by it. This is an equal misconception because that idea merely reifies this idea that we are separate from our experience, it reifies this idea, makes it solid and real. We are not different from our experience. We are our experience. The key to successful meditation is to enter experience in a calm way. Now, meditators, when they begin, always experience lots and lots and lots of thoughts. And that's because they never realized they were thinking that much before. And they experienced their concentration as being brittle. 
Now, almost every meditation begins by simplifying our sensory experience to one of the six sense gates. Now, this idea of sense gates is important. We have hearing, we have touching, we have tasting, we have smelling, we have seeing, and we have thinking and feeling. And those are the the famous six senses. This is an ancient idea that you find in every Western or even Eastern view. There are six ways experience happens to us all the time. All six are going. So the first thing we learn to do when we start meditating is to simplify to one in so-called vipassana meditation that people often talk about. It's to simplify to the sense of touch as our breath goes in and out of our nostrils or our clothes on or our, our body moves against our clothing as we breathe. But you can also use a visual object like a candle. You can use an auditory object like a bell. You can use any number of different objects of the senses. All you do is simplify to one. We, we were told to concentrate. Now, the problem with concentration is it's brittle. That's to say, if you concentrate on one thing and another thing happens, our attention gets adverted, gets grabbed by that other thing. We find ourselves suddenly doing something else. So, for example, we might be looking at a candle flame and then a thought comes up. And we are unconsciously, reflexively reacting to that thought. And suddenly we're thinking about something else. And we're told, go back to the candle flame, go back to the candle flame. Now, most people find this incredibly frustrating because they never seem to make any progress from that simple point. Somehow they can't find a way of being stable with the candle flame. And then they think, oh, my God, I've got to stop thoughts altogether. If only I could be without thoughts, I could then be stably looking at an object or hearing an object or feeling an object. This is the misunderstanding. Actually, concentration has two elements, not one. The first element is the element that is truly described by adverting, by being grabbed. It's placing attention. It's called in the old language, vitaka. It's placing attention. But there is a second part to it. It is to savor that experience to enter that experience as an experience. That's called vikara. Now, these two things are separable. For example, you might lift a cup of coffee to your lips and take the first sip. That's vitaka. The taste of the coffee, the aroma of the coffee, the savoring of the coffee, that's vikara. Now, both of those elements are concentration. When you savor something, you are still concentrating. But there is a big difference. When you savor something, if other things happen, they simply become another flavor in your savoring. They're no longer disturbing you. And as you gradually develop vikara, you get more and more stable, not separate from experience, but in experience. You have found the calm place. Now, this is the gateway to seeing clearly. Once experiences are things we savor and not things we react to, we find a dimensionality of existence that was otherwise totally unavailable, except for fleeting moments. For example, when we listen to great music or when we have a shock or when we have an ecstatic experience, there are places in our lives where just for a it or well, not a minute just for a second we're savoring but nearly always that capacity is such a strange feeling that people immediately drop out of it again what we're learning to do in meditation is to find out where that is through specific exercises then extend it and then become established in a life lived fully that means our calmness is within experience not separate from it. Now, of course, then if thoughts arise and we find them interesting, we savor them. We enjoy our imaginations. We enjoy our insights. We find our creativity grows. We find our insights grow. We're no longer trying to shut ourselves down into some sort of cave. Now, all of this is possible with very, very short meditations, as long as they are done deliberately. And this is why the three-minute thing is so important. We need to be deliberate. There's no point in sitting for an hour if 55 minutes of that hour is spent daydreaming or sleeping. Honestly, it is pointless. 
What we need to do is to understand why we might want to do something and then do it deliberately for a short period. Okay, so what's up, real quick, what's up with all the people that, are there's so many people out there that are like, I get up, I meditate for an hour a day, and sometimes you're like, Jesus, fuck, like, that's like, you know, that's a lot out of someone's life, especially if they need, you know, half an hour for exercise or something else. What is it about those people? Is there some magical thing about an hour? Is there some impression with those people? Like, oh, you, you, I'm so high minded and evolved. I can meditate for an hour. Like what's up with that? <laughs> okay, well, okay. So what's up with that is that some of them will have found the key to this and will therefore be enjoying their sitting. And maybe they genuinely sit for an hour. Others will just be sleeping. It's very relaxing to just sit in quietude and you get into this dull state of quietude, which can be very relaxing. So the answer is it depends who it is. There is no objection to sitting for an hour, none whatsoever. But you have to find the little key as to why that might be worth doing. And it's the key that matters. Once you start developing savoring, then you can savor for three minutes, do that for seven days of the week, And then maybe at the end of it, you might want to savor a bit longer. That's okay. Suddenly Mm -hmm. nothing is disturbing you because everything becomes part of a savored experience, not part of a brittle, concentrated experience. And so we have this nonsense about meditation is is so we can be here now. We somehow find this present moment. It's an utter fantasy. The present moment is a construct. There isn't a present moment. There is just presence. The idea that there's some magical knife edge of reality, either side of which is something else, is a crazy idea. And it makes people very tense when they try to do it. It's far more that when we enter our experience, we find presence. We find, if you like, a timelessness that is neither past nor present. It is merely experienced fully. And of course, if you're able to access that state and you sit for an hour, it doesn't mean anything to you. Hour goes by, nothing has happened. And indeed, I will sometimes sit for long periods and I just find myself looking at the clock and going, wow, and half an hour's gone past. Good Lord. Now, it's not that I didn't do anything. What I was doing was relaxing in a profound way. And the reason why I say that is when you get up from that sort of session, you find yourself with more clarity and more capacity to perform properly whatever it is you have to do. So there are absolute benefits. And there are lots of reasons why this has happened to us, why we are, in a way, imprisoned in a cognitive structure that is so reactive. It's to do with our evolution. It's to do with how we've come to be as biological beings. But nonetheless, now in modernity, there is a real opportunity for meditation to make a genuine and profound impact, particularly in contemporary conditions. I love it. I also just want to highlight a few things that you do offer in this book. Aside from what you've mentioned, there's some straightforward visualizations in there, explorations of sensation, Q&A sections after each exercise, providing you know further clarity. Uh, it, it really just lays it out. And like you said, it sort of compounds on itself. You're growing as you're going through the 14 weeks. Um, and we will put everything to connect with you in the show notes. But just to say it here, everybody, his website is Richard. Dixie.com. That's D I X E Y as the last name.com. And sometimes you also hold some events and sort of classes and some trainings. So you can find those at his website. What else would you I like tell to you tell what, us? Eddie, before, before you wrap up on me, let me yeah, just say this. Sure. I make a contract in this book. What I say, this is a really simple book. This is 125 pages. I say this all I want the reader to do is to read the introduction, in chapter one. My contract is I will explain everything I'm asking you to do. Then you do the simple exercise for seven days, only three minutes, the time it takes to drink a cup of coffee. Don't read chapter two. This is not about information. This is about experience. So the real pedagogy, the attempt to write behind the book is to create such clarity of explanation that every meditation exercise is fully understood before it is embarked upon. And furthermore, I've developed a free app that comes with the book that you can download to your mobile phone. So the mobile phone, you can then take that mobile phone with you, of course, as people do. And there is that simple one week, one week meditation. 
And what happens is when you've done the meditation seven times, the app releases the second weeks. And my idea is that people just do three minutes a day for seven days. Then they read chapter two. Then they do that exercise three minutes a day for seven days. Then they do chapter three. And they do that exercise three minutes a day for seven days. It adds up after 14 weeks to about five hours of meditation. But actually, what it really is, is 14 weeks of three minutes a day. Now, as you know, any habit is enforced by repetition. Yep. So even three minutes when done repeatedly has a big cumulative impact. And one finds oneself suddenly having a capacity, which would otherwise be one would thought would have to work a really long time to make. But it doesn't as long as you do it repetitively. So this isn't a book to read. This is a book to go through like a course book or something, but it's not really complicated. What I'm really trying to do is to take all of this technical talk and bring it down to something really, really simple. And my hope is whether people are established meditators and indeed many established meditators have told me they've got great benefit from doing this or whether it's people who gave up on meditation or whether it's people who are just curious about meditation, it'll work to give them a base of experience from where they can then go on, if they wish, to develop all kinds of other things, whether it's more deep engagement with meditation or deep engagement with anything else. And that's the idea behind it. So it's not, it's, it's not really a book in the sense you might read it from beginning to end and have a whole bunch of ideas. Far more, it's about embedding ideas in experience because meditation is exclusively about experience. It's about having specific experiences and building on them. And this is the key to it. So it's really an art. It's, it's not a science in the sense that we're trying to come to some solution. It's an art. It's an art of living. And it's such an important life skill. And I feel quite dedicated to try and bring it forward. And so I do. I offer meditation classes at Dharma College, which is in Berkeley. And again, there's www.dharma-college.com is the website, Dharma College. And we offer, web, we, we offer classes there on meditation. But I think the book also stands on its own. Actually, I think the book is clear enough, most people who've reviewed and read it said it is, for people to do this very easily. And they shouldn't have any problems. If they have problems, write to me. On my website, there is my email address. There's a contact me box on the website. That's richarddixie.com. And you can write to me and I'll, I'll answer your questions. But I suspect you'll find you can do these very simple exercises and it's not going to take a big chunk out of your day to do these exercises. And by all means, if you've done them all and then you feel, why well, I want to go back to week seven and do that one, go back to week seven and do that one. There's no particular reason why having done 14 weeks of it, you're meant to do something else. They just represent different ways of accessing calmness within experience, this key skill that enables us to live life fully. I love it. I love it so much. Thank you so much for your wisdom. We can tell how passionate you are about it and how much it has really enriched your life. So everybody go buy the book three minutes a day. Richard Dixie, thank you so much for your time, for joining us. And we look forward to all of the new stuff you'll be putting out there in the future. Thanks, Elle. It's been good to talk to you. You too. For everyone else, we'll see you next week. Hey listeners, you know, over the years, a ton of companies have approached me to collaborate, but I will only promote companies whose products I believe in and that I actually use and consume on a regular basis. So let me tell you about some of my favorite companies that I can offer you discounts for. Rep Provisions, an amazing company doing incredible things for our planet, topsoil, and animals with regenerative agriculture. And it's my number one source for quality pasture raised meat and chicken. Visit repprovisions.com and use code L15 for 15% off. I'm also obsessed with a company called Carnivore Crisps. They make a lean, all natural, and delicious alternative to conventional snacking made with just real meat and real salt totally addictive and my favorite ones are the beef brisket and the ribeye visit carnivorecrisps.com and use code paleo10 for 10% off i also love and regularly use paleo valley products they make amazing supplements and delicious paleo products i use the superfood greens powder grass-fed beef sticks the organ complex and their bone broth bars i love the lemon and apple i also use their essential c complex and more 
visit paleovalley.com forward slash promos forward slash L Russ for 15% off. I also love Primal Kitchen. They make delicious paleo approved, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and no refined sugar products. And I use them daily from their collagen powders and sauces and marinades to their avocado and olive oil. So good, so healthy. Visit primalkitchen.com and use code L10 for 10% off. I also love paleo powder and use it almost on everything I cook. They make incredible seasoning blends and they also have these incredible grain-free coatings that feel just like crispy breadings that you would have had prior to knowing that there's another way. So visit paleopowder.com and use code L15 for 15% off. Oh, 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 oh